Okay, so mean arterial pressure. So up until now, your first year of nursing school, we've talked about systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and most of you have probably just been thinking systolic blood pressure, it's high, it's low, you know, and that's kind of what we gauge everything by, right? We're gonna check it, we're gonna give meds, we're gonna hold the meds, okay, that kind of thing. Um, we know it, it, it is related to perfusion, it's related to um, if somebody's in shock maybe, something like that, okay? Um, so now moving along, if we take the mean arterial pressure, that is like, um, so think about your vessels have tone, right? Your vessel is not, um, it's not gonna just open and close really easily. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, it, it's got some tone to it. So when the blood goes through it, even if it's at a high pressure, it's only gonna push that vessel open so much, right? Because it has tone. That's the mean arterial pressure, okay? When we're talking about, and I'm sorry, I can't erase this. <laughs> uh, when we're talking about a blood vessel, remember back to anatomy a million years ago, the middle of your blood vessel, there's layers of muscle, right? Tunica, media, and all that stuff, okay? So there's muscle inside your blood vessels. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is, in order to get or maintain a blood pressure, the blood has to touch all sides of the blood vessel. So think about um, you're in your backyard and you've got the hose and you want to, I don't know, wash down the driveway, which we should not do in a water shortage, but it's fun. So um, you turn on the water a little bit, right? And it just dribbles. And it's probably not touching all the sides, right? Because you don't have enough pressure to maintain like a good flow of water. <clears throat> Same thing with a blood vessel, okay? So what do we do? Turn up the water. And pretty soon, now you've got a full stream of water coming from the hose because it's touching all the sides of the hose, okay? Now, if we take, now we have a full, uh, full stream, we've got good pressure, and we wanna make it more pressure, you put your thumb on the end just a little bit, make the diameter smaller, right? Vasoconstrict, it squirts out super high pressure, right? That's blood pressure in a nutshell. It's just like your hose, okay? Um, so vasoconstricting or a smaller diameter increases your pressure, okay? Now we have the, when we're looking at your heart, the systolic pressure, the reason we're so concerned about that is because your left ventricle is pumping, pumping the blood out through your aorta. And if your pressure, the systolic pressure is too high, it's gonna have trouble pumping the blood out and you're gonna end up with a decreased cardiac output, okay? Now, when we talk about mean arterial pressure, it's kind of like um, it's a more accurate number to get a feeling for what the patient's blood pressure really is, how well it can perfuse, okay? So um, there's a calculation. So it's one plus two over three is how I remember it, because one plus two is three, okay? What comes first on a blood pressure? Systolic. Systolic, so it's one systolic blood pressure plus two times the diastolic blood <coughs> pressure over three, and that's how, you, that's how the machine's figuring it out, okay? You have to have a map of 60. Research is showing it's more like 70, but 60 is still the number that we use uh, in order to perfuse all of your organs. Um, it's really nice when you're in the ICU, when you have a Foley catheter and you're doing you know, frequent blood pressures, maybe they have an arterial line or, or something. Um, you can watch the mean arterial pressure. So let's say here we have, uh, we have a Foley and our urine output is 100. Super excited because we don't have to try to, you know, get another drop of urine out of the bag, you know, and try to um, have a good number to report. But throughout the day, the patient's urine output drops, okay? And the map 
it has been above 60 for both of these, right? So now the map is 59. Our urine output maybe is 30, maybe. The next hour, our map is 58, and we're talking 15, 10 mLs. Um, the kidneys have to be constantly filled with water. It's like a water pump, and if it gums up and nothing is making it uh, move constantly, it's going to stop working. They're very sensitive. They're like little prima donnas. Okay. You do something for their blood pressure. You give them fluid. You give them a vasoconstrictor. Now their mean is 62, and I kid you not, now their urine output's 40. You can see it. You can watch the map. You can watch the urine output. When we get to um, fourth semester and you're talking about neuro, the way that we calculate perfusion to the brain is we take that pressure and we subtract the pressure in your head. So you have no room for this is just 60. It's got to be much higher for your brain. Okay. Um, I know it's not necessarily uh, physiologically correct, but if you think about the blood has to go uphill against gravity to get to your brain, it's got to have enough pressure, just like the hose, to push all the way into your brain and perfuse your brain. Okay, so um, the other thing about the map, so we know it needs to be 60. This is why a rapid response nurse will come in the room, the blood pressure's like 85 over 50, and they're like, yeah, whatever, the mean's good. And everybody else is freaking out like, oh my God, we need a drip or something. And we know that we have a little bit of time because the map is above 60. Okay, so that's where um, you become more comfortable with an acute patient when you know that information. And I think somewhere along the line, sometimes people forget that information and it's like, no, 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 stop freaking out, it's okay. Or like a cardiac patient that, um, they need a very, very low pressure so they can get the blood out of their heart. Their heart doesn't work very well. And sometimes the cardiologists will want their blood pressure, their systolic, like 85. And it's a little nerve wracking, but that's the only way that they can pump the blood out. Okay. So yeah, so your map is, um, is very important. Yes. How about ejection fraction? Do we care about that? We do care about ejection fraction a little. Um, Ejection fraction, so we don't pump all the blood out of our heart all the time. There's always a little bit left, okay? Um, so normally we pump 85, 75% of the blood out, and then there's some left over, right? So if you have a bad heart, those people usually have an ejection fraction of 30%. Um, I've seen as low as 5%, and the body has compensated amazingly, um, but they have absolutely no energy. They have just enough energy to maintain their organs. You know, they, they're not getting up and walking around and stuff. Um, so the ejection fraction is like the amount of blood, the percentage of blood that you're pumping out um, during your heart, your cardiac cycle. And it's easy to remember that because the lower it is, the worse off you are, okay? Um, how do we get an ejection fraction? How do you get that number? Echo. You have to have an echocardiogram. Good, so, and usually it's a cardiologist that has to read it. So you would go and look for um, the echo report or the cardiologist progress notes, um, something like that in order to get the ejection fraction. And it's, they're really concerned about it with people that have come in with heart failure. Um, they have poor left ventricular function, you know, those, types of people. There's nothing you can do for it. You can treat it with meds, so the beta blockers and all the blood pressure management and that kind of stuff. Um, eventually they'll go into renal failure because they're not going to have enough perfusion um, to get the blood to the kidneys. Uh, you could do a heart transplant, which, you know, those don't happen very often. And, um, but that's really all you can do. You could put them, you could put them on like an LVAD or the left, ventri left ventricle device, artificial left ventricle on the outside of your body. You could put them on something like that down in LA somewhere, you know, major medical centers, ECMO, LVAD, that kind of stuff. Um, but really there's, there's not a whole lot you can do. So usually it's treat medically. Um, and then some of them go on transplant lists. Some of them go on 
palliative care, you know? Okay? Okay. Anything else? We got about... Um,